box foot. Marcus Silberman Randall is a Holocaust survivor, driven like many others to deliver one crucial message. Don't ever forget. She's worked to establish a garden that does just that. Sometime in my 40s, I realized what we had lost. In particular, my two cousins who I lived with in Berlin before we left. In my middle 40s, it began to hurt. I needed to do something. To start the healing, Marga began speaking to groups, telling her own story of how the Holocaust affected her family, describing the history of Hitler's harsh and painful reign. The more I spoke, the more I felt, the deeper it hurt, the more I felt that when I was no longer here and we, the survivors, were no longer here, we needed to leave a legacy. That legacy is a place where people of all generations can reflect, honor, and remember. But why a garden? The answer goes back to Germany more than 50 years ago. I know how dear my family was to me, especially my opa, my grandfather. When he lost his business and after the Nuremberg Laws and I couldn't go to school, hand in hand we'd go to our garden and spend time there. So this is a garden again where uh, he might look down and say, well done. Even as a child, she knew something was different during the rise of the Third Reich. But Marga still felt safe in the town the family called home. We lived in a little village, cobblestone streets, lakes, uh, grist mills, horse and buggy, sleds being pulled by horses. This was a good life. My family lived in that area for approximately 250, 300 years. As Hitler gained power, the hate he provoked would spill into the streets. They called it Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. It was the evening that changed everything for Marga Randall, her family, and Germany itself. November 9th, 1938, I went to bed like every night, kissed my grandparents goodnight. That night I was awakened at 10 o'clock by a sound that I'll never forget. singing of hate songs, marching boots. And when I went to the window to look outside, there they came, a flare in one hand, a brick in the other. By night's end, everything was gone. Marga and her family returned to a home in ruins. Neighbors took them in at their own risk, but the refuge was only temporary. That was the exact time that most of us who were still in Germany realized that we couldn't stay there. And it was devastating. Some family members got out and ended up in Pittsburgh. The rest applied to travel, but only three were approved, Marga, her sister, and mother. Three of us got the papers. The rest of our family took us to the railroad station in Berlin, and that was the last we saw of them. Three months later, the Star of David was worn on the our outer clothing. The doors were closed. Eight months later, they were deported to four different camps. None of them made it. Nobody was left. As the years went on, Marga thrived in Pittsburgh, but thoughts of the Holocaust haunted her. When the Temple Emmanuel in Mount Lebanon built an addition, Marga worked with the rabbi on a garden that would pay tribute to those who had died. This is what I wanted. I wanted the names of the camps. I wanted to bring back the earth from Auschwitz, to bury it here, to have something tangible for those youngsters to remember. 
how many millions of people were murdered, were burnt to death. These benches, uh, with a proper atmosphere, a person can come and sit and think about their beloved who they lost. If there is a heaven and our beloved can look down, I consider this a resting place because there were no spots where you buried a person like you normally do. Every Friday during the growing season, Randall picks a rose from her own yard and brings it to the temple's garden in memory of her mother and others. She loved my roses, so as long as I have a rose bed, when I come to services Friday night, I put a rose on the bench. And then it's really for my whole family, and it's really for everybody, for all the six million. Garden designer Lynn Rubin decides on the plants and where to place them. Not an easy task for a garden that deals with such a horrific page in history. It's very difficult because the Holocaust was devoid of plants. What the Germans tried to do was take anything alive away from the prisoners and to dehumanize them and basically to disconnect them from life in general, which would include plants. But there was one very significant plant um, that kept people alive all through Eastern Europe, and that was the potato. This is probably the most symbolic here. This is the sweet potato vine, mm -hmm. and this does Lynn planted the sweet potato vine, the potato symbolizing the plant that kept, kept so many alive. living. She also chose the other plants carefully, selecting them for their relationship with the Holocaust. So then we planted the upright red sage. It is very much straight up and down, and that can be construed to be prison bars or soldiers. The bleeding heart symbolized all the pain and the sorrow that the Holocaust and the war brought on. The colors of each bloom have an important meaning for the garden, too. The bright reds represent the power and the military. Deep reds, they're the blood of the victims. And white, it's for freedom and survival. Those plants grow along the edges of the garden. But one more color might be the most essential of all. Yellow is hope and hope was very important. Hanging on to that last bit of humanity and hope was one of the most important things that caught people through the Holocaust, in the camps as well as in hiding. Marga worked hand in hand with Lynn, constructing a sanctuary of meditation, learning, and most importantly, recollection. What's the hardest thing about this whole process for you? Pain. It's a feeling of what can I do because I was spared? I was given a mission, perhaps. I would like to fulfill that mission. It's a feeling of peace for me. And again, let us always remember. Thank you.